Hey everyone and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be talking about climbing Mount Fuji. This is Japan's most iconic mountain so it's a really exciting one. We did this climb all the way back in 2019 but this video has been well requested by a lot of you so yeah we're really excited to put this one out there. We're going to be covering things from when you can climb Mount Fuji, what to pack for your climb and some top tips we recommend so that you ensure a successful climb. So first of all what is Mount Fuji? Well Mount Fuji is Japan's most iconic mountain and in fact it's its tallest as well standing at 3776 meters tall. Some would say it's the most perfectly shaped mountain there is in the world. But Mount Fuji isn't just a beautiful site. To Shinto practitioners, that's one of the main religions in Japan, they see climbing Mount Fuji as a pilgrimage to purify themselves. Quick note, Mount Fuji is still an active volcano today, but it's been dormant for quite a long time now. I think its last eruption happened about 300 years ago. So you're interested in climbing Mount Fuji. When can you actually climb it? Well, legally you can climb Mount Fuji all year round, but it's highly recommended you stick to the climbing season, which is typically between early July to early September. Why is it recommended that we stick to the climbing season? Well, it boils down to the weather conditions at the top of the summit. Even during the climbing season, it can get very cold at the summit, but as you can imagine during the winter and colder months of the year, it gets crazy cold up there. And this is on top of the fact that mountain huts at the top of the mountain are shut during off climbing seasons, which provides safe evacuation areas and also provide provisions in case of emergencies. Only very, very experienced climbers should be considering climbing Mount Fuji during off climbing season. For most of us, you wanna to stick to the climbing season. So that's typically between early July to early September. This varies from year to year because of weather conditions, but if you want to know the official dates of the year you're watching this, do check out the description. We're gonna put a link down to a website. You can see that below. When deciding to climb Mount Fuji, you're also gonna to want to know which trail to take. There are four altogether that lead to the summit of Mount Fuji. We have the Yoshida Trail, Fuji no Miya Trail, Subashiri Trail, and Gotemba Trail. Out of these four trails, the Yoshida Trail is by far the most popular out of the bunch. Around 170,000 people use the Yoshida Trail in one single climbing season. In comparison, Coming in second was the Fuji no Miya Trail, which had about 70,000 people, so less than half the amount. But why is the Yoshida Trail so popular? Well, besides it being a little bit easier, it's also the most accessible trail from Kawaguchiko. When you arrive at Kawaguchiko Station, there's actually a bus that takes you all the way to the start point of the trail. So super, super convenient. There are also mountain hut that sells supplies in case you've forgotten last minute stuff like, you know, water, food, or even forgot climbing shoes, you can purchase these at the mountain huts. But something that might not be as obvious is the fact that the Yoshida Trail is also the main pilgrimage trail that Shinto practitioners do as well. So a lot of local Japanese people also like to do the Yoshida Trail because it's considered the pilgrimage to climbing Mount Fuji. We personally did the Yoshida Trail, but we've spoken to a few other experienced Mount Fuji climbers and they've told us their favorite is the Fuji no Miya Trail, but there are certain areas that are very, very steep. They still recommend the Yoshida Trail for first time climbers. So having only climbed it once ourselves, we did the Yoshida Trail, but hopefully in the future we'll do the Fuji no Miya too. I'm only gonna touch on the Yoshida Trail today, but if you wanna know more about the other trails, do check the link in the description. Okay, so where do you start your climb? You can take a bus from Kawaguchiko that takes you up to a mountain hut and you can start the trail from there. But the Yoshida Trail actually starts at the base of the mountain. So if you were feeling up for it, you can start from the very bottom and climb all the way to the top. Very few people do this. Most start from the fifth station, which again, you can reach using a bus service from Kawaguchiko Station. Just some quick information about the bus going from Kawaguchiko it takes about one hour to reach the fish station from the Kawaguchiko station and it costs around 2,200 yen for a return trip. 
if you do decide to get return to kit, it is usable for multiple days. So if you decide to stay one night at the top of Mount Fuji, you can rest assured that you'll be able to use it the following day. Also, please, please, please plan your time carefully. If you're thinking of using the bus after 10 a.m. or even on weekends, you have to expect long queue times for the bus. So either arrive early or plan to do the climb during the weekday. So here's a popular question. How long does it take to climb Mount Fuji? Well, for us starting from the fifth station and climbing the Yoshida Trail to the top, it took six hours in total to ascend Mount Fuji and three hours to descend back down to the fifth station. But please note, this wasn't in just one setting. We split a hike across two days. And also within that time, we also took lots of breaks. We took lots of time to take photographs. We also spent an hour acclimatizing to the altitude. So I just mentioned that we did the climb across two days and that's the way I recommend most people do it as well but if you are short on time or you want to save cost by not staying a night in one of the mountain huts you can do what's referred to as a bullet climb so that's doing it all in one sitting up and down in one day we don't recommend it it's very strenuous not only is the hike very long it is quite challenging because of the elevation you're not letting your body acclimatize but for us it wasn't even about making the climb more difficult it was more about enjoying the climb itself you know taking our time photographing along the way and also being able to see sunrise from the top that's something that you just can't do without staying a night at the top of mount fuji speaking of staying at the top of mount fuji please don't expect luxury resorts of five-star hotels it's a mountain there are only mountain huts at the top of mount fuji so it's going to be very 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 basic accommodation You'll see these mountain huts all along the Yoshida Trail, but most of them you're going to have to book in advance. Don't just rock up and expect there to be vacancy for you to stay a night. That just simply will not happen during the climbing season. We unfortunately saw some climbers that really didn't know they had to pre-book. So when they arrived, they had to sleep outside in the freezing cold. Please don't be one of those people pre-book your accommodation before you go. How you do that, we'll put a link again in the description, but there are a few you can go with. We went with Fujisan Hotel ourselves. We're not affiliated with them, it's not sponsored, but we went with them because they were one of the closest to the top of the mountain. So it meant that we could do most of the ascending climb at the beginning and then before sunrise we could just do the shortest climb possible so it meant that we could wake up a little bit later than perhaps other people staying lower down the mountain so you might want to take that into consideration staying at one of the mountain huts is relatively expensive for what you're getting it costs 7200 yen per person for one night plus a 1000 yen booking fee this will fluctuate, it might be cheaper or more expensive when you go to book, but just so you know a ballpark figure of what you're looking at. Even though the price isn't expensive, I say it's relatively expensive because it's not fancy at all. Basically what you're paying for is a sleeping bag in a massive row of people. Uh, you're all basically squashed and lined up next to each other. Some people will probably freak out at the idea of it, but because you're all just trying to get a few hours sleep. No one really cares. Just put on your eye mask, some uh, earplugs, and just get a couple of hours sleep before you do the ascending climb. Oh, I forgot to mention the price I just listed for the night stay at the Mountain Hut was actually inclusive of dinner as well. So with that, we got a Japanese hamburger steak with some pickled vegetables and a curry sausage as well. So it was really delicious, but the portions are quite small, so something to note. If you didn't buy dinner, you can buy extra food and drinks whilst you're there. They run a basically a little combini service, but you can expect prices to be a lot more than if you just buy it off the mountain. What's up guys, so it's me. I was about to put the video live, but I found some new information I really, really wanted to include in this guide because I thought it'd be really helpful for you all. So the first thing is I found out that you can actually book some private rooms when you're staying at the top of Mount Fuji. How you do that, I put a link to the website where you can book this. I believe there's options for private rooms on the seventh and eighth station. So the eighth station is the one we stayed at. So it's just as high up the mountain as the shared accommodation one. So you might want to check that out. Of course, it's gonna be more expensive and there are gonna be 
much more limited availability compared to Fujisan Hotel, which was the room where you share with lots of other people. The second bit of information I wanted to add into this video is the fact that I've come across an official Mount Fuji app that's gonna be really useful. Basically, this app has lots of information on it. Most important though, it has a map of the trail, so you can have it handily on your phone rather than carrying like a paper map with you. And it also shows you where you are on the trail. So that's really, really helpful. They actually built this app because a few people were getting lost on the trails. It's quite hard to do that because with the Yoshida Trail, it's pretty much one direction. So I'm not really sure how people are getting lost. Anyway, you can ensure you won't get lost now with this app. It's also really helpful because it shows you how long it takes for the next part of your climb. So how long it takes to get to the next mountain hut. And when you get to that mountain hut, what facilities it has in place. So whether it sells food and drinks, whether it has toilets, whether you can stay a night there. So this is really, really handy. I also found on the app that it has a bus timetable for going back down the mountain. So that, again, super, super handy. I feel like this app is gonna be indispensable if you're going to climb Mount Fuji, so be sure to download it. Okay, back to the video. Do I need to be an experienced hiker to climb Mount Fuji? The short answer is no. The climb up Mount Fuji isn't to say difficult because of the terrain. It's not even that difficult because of the duration of it. The difficulty really lies in the altitude. As long as you take precautions, take some breaks, acclimatize to the altitude, you're going to be fine. We saw people of all ages and of all fitness completing the climb. Before we move on to something else, uh, I just really want to quickly touch on what altitude sickness is because you might be thinking, you know what, I'll just power through it. What's a little altitude sickness? Please don't. Altitude sickness is not nice. Both me and Sarah experienced it during our climb Mount Fuji. And again, we've climbed many mountains in the past. We've climbed taller mountains. We have never experienced altitude sickness until we did Mount Fuji. So please don't take it lightheartedly. Uh, you can get quite serious symptoms like nausea, vomiting, muscle aches, dizziness. It's just really not nice. So please do take your precautions and just take breaks. So another one of the challenges with climb Mount Fuji is the change in temperature. It's quite difficult to imagine because it's very warm around Mount Fuji around that time of year. But when you get closer to the summit, it drops below zero degrees. It is freezing at the top. So you're going to want to wear something that's relatively light and short when you're doing the ascend. But the closer you get to the summit, and especially if you're waiting around to watch sunrise, you're going to want to bring something that's warmer. Bring multiple layers, stuff it in your bag. Better yet, bring like a light down jacket. That will do you wonders for the morning. You're also going to want to know the weather conditions on the mountain. Uh, just because Google tells you that it's nice and sunny around Mount Fuji, on the mountain, things might be completely different. So you're gonna to wanna to use a special website, I'll link it in the description, that just tells you the conditions on the mountain and it gives you like a really handy grading system as well to tell you how safe it is to climb Mount Fuji. So use that website to check before you go. Just quick note, it is in Japanese, so you might need to use Google Translate to translate the page, but that shouldn't be too difficult to do. The other chance to climb in Mount Fuji is the uneven surface. Most of Yoshida Trail is along rocky terrain. It can be slippery at times. You're going to want to wear something that's suitable for rocky terrains, but if you fear you, you might slip a little bit here and there, you can pick up hiking poles in the mountain huts or bring them with you if you want. Or even better yet, pick up one of the wooden hiking poles I'll touch on that in a little bit. That'll just help you stabilize a lot. It makes a world of difference when you're going up and down the mountain. Okay, we're most of the way through the guide, but let's talk about what things to pack. So I'm gonna just read off the list because I don't remember exactly what we had, but I'm sure this list will help. So we brought short sleeves tops, shorts, but also the long sleeve thermal, thermal trousers as well, if you're very scared of cold, socks. We brought two pairs just in case it rained. We didn't want to hike in wet socks. We didn't use it, but it was nice knowing we could change into them if we needed. Hiking shoes, really important you wear ones with good grip. If you worry about your hands getting cold, uh, bring gloves, a down jacket, and then a rain jacket just in case it rains. And then I've got optional items, a cap, 
sunglasses. Uh, I didn't mention this earlier, but the Yoshida Trail and lots of the other trails, because of the loose rock, there's a lot of like dust that gets kicked up when you're walking and that can get in your eyes. So sunglasses help with that. And also we brought a uh, bandana that we just kind of wrapped around our nose and mouth as we're descending. Because as you're going down, unless you want to inhale a lot of like sand and dust uh, bring a bandana that really really helped sunscreen portable charger so one of these like battery banks really really helps there are no power sockets at the top well there are but they're very limited everyone's fighting over to use them so bring one of these it should be more than enough for you to complete the hike up and down hiking poles makes your life easier climbing a head torch highly recommend this actually if you're going to be doing a two-day hike where you're hiking to see sunrise rain cover for your bag just to protect everything inside oh and a really important one actually this shouldn't be optional you should definitely bring this there's lots of 100 yen coins toilets in mountain huts you have to pay 100 yen you don't want to be caught out where you can't use the toilet because you don't have a 100 yen coin that's most of the stuff that we recommend bringing or what we brought ourselves if you are traveling with a lot of luggage on you you're obviously not going to want to bring that to the top of the mountain with you you're going to have to find a luggage locker to put your stuff in you can find these at kawaguchi coast station or at accommodations around Kawaguchiko. Many of them provide luggage service, you just pay them a fee. What we did, we booked an accommodation after our climb, and then we emailed them asking if we could leave our luggage there, and they were more than happy to let us do that. So we basically, before our climb, dropped our luggage off, went and did our climb, and then when we came back down the mountain, our luggage was already at the accommodation we were staying. So the last part I want to touch on, just how much it costs to climb Mount Fuji. Before I discuss prices, I just want to put a little asterisk on this part because prices vary all the time. It sometimes goes down, but more often than not, it goes up. This is why we generally don't like discussing prices, but we understand how useful it is for you when you plan your own trip. So I'm going to put up a list of everything that we spent and all the prices up here. Do note that the accommodation we checked this morning and it's gone up to 20,000 yen if we were to stay there now. Out of all the items, I just want to make a quick mention of the Mount Fuji mini hiking stick um, because it's so cool. I want to show you guys. I've got it up here actually. Okay. Right. So what it is, you can see here, if it goes in focus, there you go. What it is, is just literally a wooden stick. And this stick is basically a hiking stick. But the real reason why you buy one of these, you're going up the mountain, you pay these people inside the mountain huts about 200 to 300 yen to get your walking stick stamped. So you can see there's a few stamps on here. We didn't get all of them because we've got a mini hiking stick. You can't fit all of them on there. So we just chose the ones that we really like the designs of. But basically each one is like a blessing. Uh, they're all unique as well. So it's really, really cool. It's one of our favorite souvenirs we've ever gotten on our travels. I highly, highly recommend it. We didn't go for the large one just because it was a faff to bring it back. You know, who wants to bring a massive stick back? Uh, so we just got a mini one, yeah, as a memory thing. And then we keep it up here now. So we've come to the end of a guide. One last question. Is climbing Mount Fuji worth it? The only answer we can give you is a resounding yes. It doesn't matter that the climb itself isn't the most challenging, nor is it the most scenic or the most adventurous. Climbing Mount Fuji feels like an accomplishment. You've just climbed the country's tallest mountain and it's a symbolic one as well. Lots of people travel to Japan to marvel at the beauty of the mountain. Very small portion of those people actually end up climbing and summiting Mount Fuji. So you can be one of those people that can feel proud of themselves for achieving something that a lot of people have yet to do. So that's it. That's the end of our guide to climbing Mount Fuji. We hope you found this one useful. If you end up doing it yourself, please let us know how it went. We love to hear your travel stories. Or if you have any questions that you feel like we haven't covered in our guide, please drop a comment down below and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. But for now, I'll see you guys on the next one.